Okay, folks, we're on um, 12.15 and so we'll get started. Uh, kia ora koutou. my name is Mary O'Keefe. Uh, I'm a member of Ekamos New Zealand. And firstly, my apologies for last week. I was supposed to be um, hosting our first uh, seminar last week, but anyone who lives in Wellington will know that we had absolutely appalling weather, which actually took out my internet completely and then took out my car for about um, two hours, which was, you know, basically the fun of living in Wellington. So uh, we're about to get um, started. Um, I have in the invite for this event, um, you will have been sent a link to Slido, which is the app we're using to manage questions for this. I'm pretty sure you used it last week, but just to note that that's how we will be asking questions. So fire your questions through uh, using Slido. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to the chair of ECOMOS New Zealand, uh, Pam. Can you wave, Pam? Hello, there's Pam, uh, who is going to introduce our speakers today. Over to you, Pam. Thanks, Mary. Um, so welcome, everybody. Uh, if you made it to last week's talk, thanks for joining that one. And welcome to number two. And if you've just joined us for today's one, uh, good. And please make sure you come to all of them because they're going to be all good. Um, so today's uh, topic is the digital realm and New Zealand heritage, bringing architectural theory and practice into the modern architect's workflow. Uh, the project that they will be presenting is actually uh, quite of interest to me personally as well, because the building one at the Unitech campus grounds was where the School of Architecture was. And I know it's not there anymore, which is really, really sad. Um, but there'll be a few people here, I'm sure, that may have also studied there. And if they're not, when this goes, when this um, is posted online, for people to view, I will certainly be making sure that all my uh, peers during my study years will be uh, linked to watching this. So today's speakers are uh, ECOMOS member and newly appointed board member at that, uh, Dr. Renata Yadrezan Malik. She's an associate professor at the School of Architecture at Unitech. And she's joined by Thomas Rutlinger, who's a research assistant at the School of Architecture for Unitech and the As Built Digital. And Shan Singh, who's also a research assistant at the School of Architecture at Unitech. So this paper presents a case study, results of the Unitech research project called Digitalization of Heritage in New Zealand, approved for the 2021 year. The project aims to present unknown, vulnerable, uh, and by vulnerable they mean in the process of degradation or transformation, uh, an abandoned historical heritage through a multimedia presentation on the one hand, and to set up information tools for the preservation, restoration, maintenance, and evaluation of the building on the other hand. It is based on the integration of traditional analog and instrumental uh, by digital methods of heritage surveying with an emphasis on using digital technology. And so on that note, I will hand over to, to our Dr. Renata to get the ball rolling. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pam. Thank you, Mary, as well. And kia ora, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues from Historic Places Aotearoa and ICOMOS New Zealand as well as the wide audience who kindly joined this initiative Heritage Bites. It is our really great pleasure to be included in this lecture series and to share what we did with you. Uh, my name is Renata and I am architect and architectural historian who Pam introduced first. My two co-presenters and co-authors in the project are my younger colleagues, both of them former Unitech students and current young professionals, Thomas Reutlinger and Sian Sain. Uh, I just want to make sure that Tom is sharing the screen with us because I can't see the screen at the moment. So is it the situation? Yes. Is everyone yeah. seeing that now? I think we do. Yes. Yes. I'm, I'm Tom, by the way, everyone. Hi, Tom. <laughs> hey. yeah. 
Thank you, Tom. So, so just with this first title slide, which title of our uh, talk, uh, we wanted to say that practically our talk responds broadly to the existing and we would say ongoing discussion between architects, architectural historians, architectural students, surveyors, engineers on the role of new digital technologies in architecture today and how have digital media and the technological revolution we have seen in the last decade and more altered what we employ in our work. More specifically with our project, how can the practice of dealing with heritage buildings in New Zealand be enhanced through the use of modern digital technologies? With the next slide, we are practically announcing our project and confirm that we examined these questions through this research project. It was approved for 2020, extended for 21, and now we have phase, third phase in 2022, and the belonging elective course in our School of Architecture. Pam shared with you what are overall project's aims and objectives, and that it is based on the integration of traditional research and instrumental digital methods of heritage surveying that have emphasis in the project. But I want to add maybe that for us, it was important to have both academic and practical value in advancing knowledge about heritage in New Zealand, but to be useful for the end users as well, to people who will use our work and material we develop, hopefully. As such, the project practically aligns with UNITEC organizational priorities by including students' engagement in the research directly, having connections with teaching, and creating of ongoing industry and community connections and partnerships. Practically as such, we propose that architectural heritage and history can and should be taught by doing and by starting from current events, what is that our community needs. So the second phase was practically what we are pre preparing to share with you today, includes digital recording and modeling of Unitex building one. What is the building? And in, in this and next slide, I think we wanted to show you some of historical photos of the building. Probably all who live in Auckland know that, you know, it is a notable example of late 19th century institutional architecture. It still has intact elements from each of the periods of significant building construction. It is landmark building. And at the time when it was built, it was Auckland Psychiatric Asylum from 1865 to 1992, it was the asylum. It, won that, it was then purchased by Carrington Polytech, soon to be renamed Unitech Institute of Technology, where we work, uh, who refurbished the building to become Unitech School of Design and newly formed School of Architecture and Construction in 90s. Now, as a tertiary educational institution, this historic building practically converted first time to house now departments of architecture and design. And with its new program, it had new important now didactic function as again, exemplar of architectural and social values of the past. In 2019, new change happened. And this building was purchased by the New Zealand government to become part of an affordable housing development that will comprise between 3,000 and 4,000 homes. So, this is the heritage building. Heritage New Zealand lists the original building as category one heritage building. And there is recognition of its historical, social, cultural significance. The building is listed, but as we know, listing itself provides no guarantee of protection from demolition. The building was vacated in January, 2020. And since then, the building practically sits unused and is in an abundant state. And we again know that we don't want our heritage buildings to stay abandoned for too long. Moreover, the building is not earthquake proof. So although we acknowledge the importance and distinctive character of the place, the future of the building seems, and especially in 2020, seemed to be completely uncertain. On the other good side, we know also that Manafenu, Otamaki, and the Crown are development partners 
for that residential development on the site. And they do intend to make decisions on the future adaptive reuse and pre preservation of building one. We also know on good side, and we see on this slide, the community loves the building, wants to use it and bring it into the heart of the community. We saw that from the series of community events organized in 2021 by Ponchev Social Community Trust to inform the Crown and Manafenua's decision on the future use of building one. And our project responds to all those current events practically by providing digital archive of the building one, the project involves the scanning using LIDAR and photogrammetry technology, drone capturing and 3D modeling of building one with the main goal to reduce the risk of the loss of building one, to retain cultural heritage in digital form and to ensure their existence and authenticity for a long period of time. On the next slide, uh, I want to sh share with you who were our partners and just briefly how we did this. And then I will give the floor after that to Tom and Sian. Just to tell you, so the project was multidisciplinary collaboration, still has a number of experts and specialists contributed, help us to gain first, then exchange, then interpret complex information and data about such an important and old, you know, heritage building. Uh, and it was done in partnership with surveyors, architects, engineers from the construction sector, such as SBIL Digital and Malcolm Archbold from Service. It is supported by the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development and Auckland Council's Heritage Unit. And the final work will be shared with Mana Fenua, Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, and the community body, Ponchev Social Enterprise Trust, once we have it all. How we did it? A little bit differently in 2020 from 2021 with two different groups of students. We started with desk research, analyzing all historical published and unpublished data, extensive report existing old conservation plan prepared by Salmon Reed Architects in 1994, numerous guests and people who did previous research, which included Bertie Platzman, the author of the documentary on building one really powerful documentary, and Sue Thompson, for example, who worked in the hospital as a nurse, and through all those stories, students heard some of the former staff and patients who shared their personal experiences on how the spaces were used and what was the experience of the building. That was important for us because at that point in 2020, we didn't know we would be able to do scanning and modeling of all of that huge building. So at first point, we wanted to make sure that we record and 3D visualize maybe the most important segments of the building. What is also important to mention, the students took part in the community event organized by Ponchev Social Enterprise Trust to help in preparing the Carrington Hospital Community Feasibility Study. And finally, the students and the team had exceptional learning experience and we can't thank enough to our industry partners and leaders in the country and internationally. I will name Mary McKee, who worked at that point for Salmon Reed Architects, who delivered lecture, mainly Malcolm Artbold, expert for drone surveying from service, who helped us hugely and shared enormous knowledge with our students and practical skills. Freddy Nodalo from SBILT, all of them delivered lecture. In 2021, we also had Chirac from our club de delivering lecture. And scanning then started, it was planned and organized as educational workshops. And I am now giving the floor to Tom, who will uh, take you through this part of the presentation. Well, thank you, Renata. Uh, hi, everyone again. Um, yeah, so I'll run through the process. Um, all the tools and, and softwares we used to um, document building one and the process of how we did that and how we developed those assets into more traditional means. And, and Sian will pick up where what we want to want to do with those in the future. Um, so some of you might have heard of a point cloud before. Um, and for those of you who haven't, that is a asset created using uh, either LiDAR or photogrammetry scanning tools, either drone-based or terrestrial. Um, and what you end up with 
is essentially thousands of points rendered in space that accurately depict the building um, in its current condition and to, to very high accuracies. And, and of course you get that in the 3D space and you can interact with it in multiple ways. Um, so for us, we use terrestrial ground-based scanners uh, throughout building one, uh, courtesy of Asbel Digital at the time, as well as uh, some stuff with Malcolm there as well. Uh, and this just screen just encapsulates um, the various steps that we've taken uh, and some of those um, different tools and, and, and phases that the process has gone through. But don't worry, we'll get, we'll go in depth into this. Um, so like Renata was saying, we started out those workshops, uh, getting the students involved with the scanners inside building one and around the building as well. The students were able to see how uh, they worked as well as uh, our experts explaining the technology about that, uh, as well as some best practice that works around it. Um, and essentially how those are working is you have that uh, laser scanner mounted to a tripod. You're taking that throughout the building, uh, giving it about two minutes to spin around, shoot out millions of lasers um, and, and accurately record those distances to, to surfaces uh, back to the scanner. Um, and you're gonna do that one scan at a time. Uh, but as you can see on the right, using the software built into the tools, you can start to link all those individual scans uh, by aligning the geometry. And eventually you're gonna get uh, an entire building. There you can start to see that even the floor plan is, is starting to uh, become visible, even just as you're doing it live on site. And eventually once you've stitched all those scans together through the process of registration, uh, you end up with an entire 3D model that you can interact with. Uh, here's just a screenshot of it essentially, um, but we'll, I think we're about to see something a bit more interactive here. So this is a mesh that's been produced from the drone model. Um, this is a complete 3D model of the entire building in sight. Um, and yeah, you can, you can, and this is just a video, but you could interact with this like a 3D model. And we'll see a bit more of that later in the presentation. And I'll just pop over screens uh, just to show what that does actually look like. Cool, so here I have the point cloud uh, in Asbuilds Vault, which is an online viewing platform for assets. Um, this you can see here, I'm just navigating around the point cloud live. And the beauty about this is you can, you can see the building as it was documented at the time. And you can start to use all the traditional tools that you're used to like sectioning, and you can see the, the interior and exterior of the building rendered in color. Oh, go, fix that. I'll just fly around now as well. You can see we can do a fly through of the building. Oh my gosh. Sorry, it's a little bit hard to control through the remote session. <laughs> There we go, that's a bit better. But you can kind of see that the detail that you're really capturing through these scans is really powerful. Uh, and you can employ a whole bunch of analytical tools that will allow you to uh, work with this data. But even just going through it like this is, is quite novel in its own right. Uh, yeah, so now that we have that data, we have to um, take that down into a workable state. And for us, that meant working with 14 odd students who were gonna model the building. Uh, so we divided the building appropriately into 14 different zones uh, that we could hand off in smaller chunks to the students 
uh, and then eventually combine together in, in what we call federation. So here you can see uh, how we've divided up the zones with the, the floor plan in reference. Um, and once we get that in student hands in, in a more traditional software like Revit, uh, you can see how the point cloud, you, you can make out the plans if you start cutting it up in various ways. Uh, and you can see what you end up doing is, is you essentially trace the building in 3D. So you get an super accurate as built CAD model to go along, support, along with the point cloud. And uh, once you have that CAD model, that's obviously an asset that you can use. Um, that, that's just the start point of, of anything you want to do with that, really. And this is the federation process where we can see those individual student zones uh, start linking back together geospatially uh, in, in our federated model. So at, at the end, even though we've divided it up into um, 14 different zones, every student was modeling off a geo reference point cloud so that once you do load them back together, they are starting to, to populate properly reference to each other. And I believe this is where I hand over to Sia. Yes, sweet, that's correct. <laughs> hey guys, how are you going? Um, pretty much the whole federation process and the whole communication process was actually done on Discord, which is a software not too dissimilar from Teams, for example, where you can make multiple rooms and organize each other around them. Um, so Discord was used as a digital teaching platform, especially because of the pandemic. And this allowed us to cross collaborate with students as well as host a multitude of tutorials and have lecture sessions with them. Um, Pretty much that they created a small social community where the students would kind of go back and forth with us and themselves, and then they'd all upskill at the same um, sort of moment. Through Discord, we also held those tutorials and recorded them, um, as well as doing a few other teaching sessions. And that just created a lot of teaching resources that we will later upload to our website that we're working on. But yeah, those teaching resources can be used by many, many other people and the public to just understand point clouds and model from them. Um, on the next slide, this cross collaboration was quite useful when students had to take their individual components like how Tom was showing before in that federation component and join them together. Since each model was a slightly um, different level of detail, for example, everybody you know, had their own sort of modeling standards to go from. The students had to detail their models accordingly to match each other's um, models. So you had students who had more detailed models, some less detailed, and what ended up happening is everyone had to upskill at the same time and get to a really good skill level um, both individually, but as the whole sort of um, cohort. And, you know, we found that the students just really upskilled really fast with all that support um, on Discord. And yeah, as you can see on the slide here, the final outcome of all these individual elements is a highly accurate floor plan of building one itself in its sort of um, merged state. Um, during the sort of modeling process too, the students learned many skills such as modeling in Revit, for example, and how to model an as built piece of architecture to a certain level of detail, which is highly applicable to their sort of future careers as as built and sort of these sort of designs become, I guess, a bit more common as they and compared to what they previously were. Um, so besides those modeling things, the students also learned about the history of the site and found missing rooms almost where there'd be no data, for example. So when you do a 3D scan, you get all of these rooms that show up in walls, but you can very easily make out where there's a blank space. And a lot of students discovered missing rooms, missing walls and things like that. So from that, that you can kind of draw a narrative of the history of the site. Um, one of the student quotes by a student named Jenny Short, she titled this Discoveries, and I'll just read that out to you guys. With only being in building one during the first year of my degree, I never had a chance to explore the entire building. I also had never been in the section that was allocated to me, which meant I was unfamiliar with the layout. So through this process, Jenny learned about the building that she never inhabited um, through the preserved digital space represented in a point cloud format. This highlights that sort of point cloud preservation, um, you know, it allows memories and historic spaces which are now inaccessible or demolished to be experienced, giving opportunity to rediscover portions of our heritage through this digital medium. Um, on the next slide, 
the outcome of the sort of digital modeling, you know, obviously to learn how to model, uh, but it leads to a highly detailed digital twin of the existing sites. So many assets can be produced from this here. For example, an amazing master's thesis project by graduate and fellow researcher, um, Lorraine Kay, who used the base model in her adaptive reuse based design for her thesis, which created a strong cultural hub for the people of Point Shev through the preservation and improvement of building one. So you can see those renders over there. She's the base model and then remodeled over that to come up with something a bit more interactive for the community. Um, it's also important to note that LIDAR scan preserves every bit of detail like you'll see on the next slides. So therefore the lower detailed models with basic elements can be upgraded on a needly basis. For example, the low detail model on the left was later transformed into a superbly detailed presentation model, which is on the right, showing up all the intricate elements of building one's architectural school staircase, which will be shown in the next slide also. So this was done by our research partner, Rima Ribonici, and he modeled a very important aspect of building one that a lot of the architecture students there would remember. It's the old staircase that leads downstairs and it's regarded with very high sort of heritage value. And you can see in the point cloud on the top left there, every bit of detail is captured and is able to be traced and modeled as you can see in these sort of white box models that Rima has done. As well as in the next slide where Tom has taken a basic model of the federated student stuff and started to transform it and add more and more detail onto that there. So onto the next slide. Um, there are many more outputs that can be produced rather than just a digital BIM model, for example, for use of accurate. So Tom will open up a Sketchfab link and Sketchfab is just a digital presentation platform to which you can upload meshes and point clouds to and literally share that with the public. So, you know, you can get really nice detailed models and share them with people. And that just makes the sort of profession a lot more accessible, you know, the whole preservation aspect, the whole architectural aspect, you can share that with the public with ease nowadays and everyone can sort of experience it. This is just a small prop from the larger point cloud, but taking this year forward, you could imagine, you know, people putting on their VR goggles and walking through the site and stuff like that there. So all of this here can be, you know, preserved by the medium of point clouds. And yeah, as you see below, the, this slide here that Tom's put up, um, the highly detailed point cloud by LIDAR can you know, preserve these facades and images that people would have seen and experienced in the past and you just bring them back to a digital medium that anyone can experience at any time. So that will bring me to, my, to the end of my part and I'll hand that back to uh, Tom and Renata. Thank you, Sian. Thank you so much. Uh, what I wanted to also share with the audience before we go to the questions, uh, is that, you know, uh, in terms of how students interpreted point cloud that we had and how overall um, uh, research needed to be done around that point cloud so that they understand it well, we can have one separate talk only about that, you know, quotes from students reports were just amazing, you know, they are uh, talking about remembering to look at photographs of the building and constantly cross-reference from available material was important to uh, get an accurate modeling result. Then vertical section, one close next to another to examine those non-existing rooms that they discovered through the point cloud that they couldn't see from the outside nor from the inside sometimes because, you know, some spaces were just built in. And uh, all of that is really has its, its own separate story. But uh, to conclude maybe with three main messages from working in this project and previous project that I took part of in Italy, where I actually had seven of our New Zealand students in 2018 doing similar project with Italian colleagues. Uh, so also through conversations with colleagues in the country and internationally, and by working closely with students, I, I am confident that heritage as a topic and heritage preservation has an increasing interest in students. And I believe, why is this? One, likely due to its relevance to design, new design and existing building, and use of digital immersive technology that young people are very interested in but also the retention of cultural heritage for meeting climate change and environmental emission targets are so important today. So the topics around heritage, adaptive reuse are in the center of conversations. And this 
last 2021 Pritzker Prize Award went to Anne Lacaton and Jean-Philippe Vazal, who have never demolished, they repeat as mantra, they give the name to their project, never demolish, never demolish what could be redeemed, make sustainable what already exists. So, and, and also we are aware of the, you know, quote, the greenest building is already built building. So we are more and more aware that we cannot afford to lose heritage and we, we can't because of our planet. Our planet cannot cope with demolitions and building new and new all the time. Not to mention huge multi-layer benefits for our community from the work that, that we created. So we also strongly feel if our results inform and help maybe bringing government and Manafenua decisions about the what can be done, you know, with the building in future. And we did something uh, for our society. And we did that at high professional level because we have critique, we we make sure that all our orthographic drawings and models that we are producing are accurate. So I think this is not only learning about knowledge and skills in our students, but also strong message for our students that they do have a role and that the society wants them to help and that they have huge responsibility, you know, which is also rewarding feeling that you serve your community well. And I think as schools of architecture, we really can do more and help more to our communities to keep our heritage, to help bringing decisions about that. And we are eager to do that. Our students are smart, young, full of energy, full of love for learning, and I think eager to engage with something like we shared with you today. So I think we would end here and, and hopefully uh, answer to some questions that we might uh, have in the meantime. Uh, thank you to the three of you. Uh, Tom or Sian, can I get you to stop sharing your screen at the moment? Thank you, just so we can sort of all see each other. So um, as I noted, we're controlling the questions through the um, Slido app. I have got uh, three questions sitting here. So the first one is uh, collaboration using the software. Sounds great and efficient. My golly, doesn't it just? Um, how do you see this working in the professional sphere between architects, engineers, clients, et cetera? Um, and then I think the same person has added a follow-up question. And by extension to the above, do you know what the cost benefits would be of this modeling and collaboration? So yeah, the question is sort of, how do you see it working and what would the cost benefits of this collaboration be? Uh, I, I think I can answer that. Um, it's something I deal with on, on a daily basis uh, with my work at Asbuilt. Um, so I, I, I'm a BIM coordinator um, by day and heritage research assistant by night kind of thing. Um, so yeah, having everyone operate off the same datum is, is hugely important and, and really makes that collaboration between um, different trades so much more convenient and efficient and accurate and, and really takes out that human uh, error aspect of it. Um, you were dealing with a project usually where uh, each in, in different engineering trade is working off their own model. Sometimes they're working in CAD, some people are working Revit, some people are working in Tecla. Um, just being able to have, firstly, a, a central um, data environment that everyone can bring that into, but a, a solid standard that everyone bases their templates off is, is so um, hugely important to actually facilitate that kind of environment where you have good visibility over what the other people are doing. Um, so you can coordinate your work around theirs and vice versa. And, and it, it really saves the person on site at the end of the day who's looking at a construction drawing and um, saves them having to do some some on-site ingenuity um, as, as well as you get that digital twin of of the finished product as well which is useful for for all kinds of people 
Um, just to sort of elaborate on that in terms of the, sorry, what was that question again about the cost? Could you just reiterate that? Yeah, so the um, question was asking, what are the cost benefits of this kind of modeling and collaboration? Right, right, I see, okay. I mean, yeah, I guess Tom. Oh, Sean. Yeah, sorry, yep, yeah, I'm back now. Yeah, I guess Tom's all spoke on it a little bit, but um, just to elaborate on that, it's pretty much the same cost as a traditional survey, but you're getting a lot more data also because you're getting all this 3D stuff. Obviously, it's all um, sort of coordinated, as Tom said, on that datum, but you're getting a 3D piece of data and a BIM model with it usually. Some of this is also something I do day to day. And you just get a lot more detail. You know, you can pick up all the crevices, all the gutters and everything quite easily and get that thing modeled in. So you actually end up saving a lot more money. You don't have to go back to the site as many times, especially if your site's very far away. For example, if you're in Auckland and the site's in Queenstown or something, you don't have to constantly go in site and reference photos. You can get everything to a very high accuracy right off the bat from that model. And, you know, it saves time and money down the line instead of going back and forth as RFIs because measurements are often everything. So there's a lot of benefits to it and it is actually being quite greatly adopted right now in the industry. Would it, would it also uh, be fair to say too that there's potentially international savings in the sense that you may have a particular expert in some aspect of the building or the technology or something and they live in, I don't know, Moscow, London, whatever. Um, again, rather than having to fly there, so saving some some carbon miles, they can- Exactly, I guess. Absolutely. Data. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I mean, that, that is the whole idea behind, I guess, you know, building information modeling too, and then supplementing that with point clouds and visual information. You can very easily just upload something to Google Drive, that point cloud, send it off to them, and they can do their work on it and then link it back to you. And because it's all coordinated in the same datum, it literally just layers on top of each other and snaps on top. So it's a, it's a pretty, I guess, a useful process, saves a lot of time, and, you know, just makes, makes everything a lot more streamlined in an industry where there's so much going on. Um, there's one further question on Slido, and I can see that there's a question on the Zoom chat, so I'll come to that too. Um, the questioner asks, have you used Polycam? And if so, what's your opinion of it? I think that would be more for you, Sian. I've never used Polycam, actually. Um, I don't even know what that is, sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, assuming is a something kind of like Pix4D or... or I imagine it's, okay, a, it's, a, tool. it's yeah. a yeah it looks like a lidar sort of free no i haven't we have our own internal softwares that we end up using um that just works pretty streamlined with our workflows um but I'd, I'd say give it a go it looks like it's pretty well documented um the way that we usually use them is we'll we'll pop them into a software like revit or something and do a model out of that there and we'll do all our measurements and stuff and that rather than off the raw point cloud because what happens with the point cloud is um you know, all these older buildings too, none of the walls are plumb and a lot of the things are skew. So you don't, you know, getting measurements up there is a little bit hard. So it's good to rationalize things in a way. And yeah, just modeling it helps that and then doing your measurements of that. Yeah, so for this project in particular, uh, we, we had the benefit of, of using um, Leica software. So Cyclone right the way through. Um, but I understand there's there's so many more options for doing point cloud registration on these days. Um, yeah, the 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 whole market or, or industry for it has really exploded in the last uh, three years or so. Yeah, that that is an important point because of course not of all of that equipment that we needed, Unitech had. Unitech currently has, for example, uh, like a TS total stations. Uh, and we can establish control points around the building, but we still need a laser scanner to collect the point clouds from the interior and exterior of the building. And this is what we got from our industry partners. Mm -hmm. Also regarding software, we do have Autodesk license, Revit license, BIM 360 teams to, to hold central model. But we, for example, don't have Cyclone to do the point cloud processing. So this is where our industry partners helped us to practically get what we need so that we model from it because you know raw data we can't just use so it was really really fantastic complexity in everything that we had to deal with thank you now i'm just looking there's a couple of questions in the chat 
So the first one is just noting it's an amazing presentation. My golly, isn't it just? So what is the potential of these technologies for mapping Earth-based Māori heritage, such as that at Manga Kia Kia and Manga Fao? I think Sian can answer this because he's he did some really interesting underground scanning work. Yeah, the company I work for, um, there's an artist who works with us named Chirag Jindal. So I, I'd, I'd recommend you guys search him up if you can. Um, he does a lot of, I guess, cave scans underground, like under Auckland, and um, that they all relate to Maori heritage, to Maori burial grounds and stuff. And there are a lot of projects at the moment. Sorry, guys, I'm so constructed fast. Sweet. Um, there are a lot of heritage projects going on. Um, going on around the world and not just in Z, where you can sort of scan the land that things are on and through those LIDAR scans just make out almost prints of where the houses and stuff used to be or even just preserving like marae and other sort of Modi heritage sites through those LIDAR scans so yeah you can very easily preserve things um, just by going on site with the LIDAR scanner scanning it exporting it to your PC and then there you have it you can create artwork from it you can create those um maps and everything from that there and you don't even need to get a um, modeler to work on it for 200 plus hours to get all that painstaking detail of detail of yeah ornamentation. yeah because um, the raw lidar scan will just be super detailed up to a couple millimeters so yeah that'll capture the wear and tear just as much on historic sites i'd recommend uh if you look at sciarc uh their website is c-y-a-r-k um, they're great. They do heritage sites all across the world um, and, and have uh, fantastic 3D modeling uh, views where you can look at all of those as well as virtual walkthroughs. Uh, they're really cool. They've been operating for a long time, so they have a, a very big database of heritage sites. Um, if I can just be a bit cheeky and jump in with my archaeologist hat on, um, certainly increasingly uh, this kind of technology is being used to, to map and manage um, archaeology. So we often use LiDAR data just to get landscape information, plus also some really wonderful um, interpretation projects are happening now using um, scanning uh, technologies such as this to, to uh, present sites, to almost digitally reconstruct how it was, that kind of thing. It's wonderful, really, really exciting space. Um, there's a question there also, uh, which you guys can probably see. Was there a conflict between the point cloud being out of plumber alignment and Revit model? Ab absolutely. Um, we know in CAD software, it likes to work in, in nice square units. Uh, that's obviously not the, the case in reality in building one. Um, but there is a bit of a judgment call and, and capturing what, what detail is actually worth capturing in that regard versus what you're actually going to use the asset for. Um, so that's that's a whole can of worms in, in level of detailing, which has um, New Zealand has a whole standard for. Um, but yeah, uh, for those of you who are interested, we, we only took it up to LOD 200, uh, which is about the second level um, out of five for that, uh, where you don't you, you don't capture all the eccentricities. Uh, Sian wants to say goodbye. He has to see his client right now. So yeah, sorry about that, guys. But it was lovely talking to you guys, and I will catch you guys at the next conference. Also, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah. Uh, Cheers, guys. I, I and I would like to join to answer with Tom previous question because I think it's very important. You know, this is where we have fantastic, you know, experience from students talking about their learning. And you know, that confusion between Revit doing one thing, but building showing another thing. And you know, uh, it was immediately obvious, they say, when we began modeling that building one was not perfect. Some of the youngest ones say, the floor weren't always flat, sometimes featuring a slight slope. The walls had different thickness and varied greatly in their alignment. So we have plenty of material. And then what they did to cope with that and how practically they modeled the building as built and not by using tools already pre-offered in uh, computer programs. I think if anything, having the Revit model, um, well, comparing the Revit model to the point cloud is, is 
probably the way you're actually going to only notice all those uh, what I call eccentricities in the building, like the warped floors, the bowed walls. Um, you're really only going to notice that once you put up a straight edge to it. Um, so yeah, again, that, that's, that's another powerful tool of, of being able to see those two things at the same time. You will notice those and they'll stick out like a sore thumb. <clears throat> Okay, folks, we're at one o'clock, so we probably need to call this quits. I, frankly, I could go on talking about this stuff for ages because it is so fascinating and it's obviously, uh, you know, the future of our profession of being able to do all of this kind of stuff. So huge thank you to our three presenters today. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, next week's seminar is Dr. Kurt Bennett, um, who's going to be talking about uh, maritime cultural heritage um, of the HMS Buffalo, which um, again, as an archaeologist, I just happen to know is a really, really cracking good project. It's been a fascinating maritime archaeological pro project. So uh, with a bit of luck, see you all there next week. And in the meantime, have a good week. Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you.